All right, so here in chapter 9, we're going to be taking a look at uh, microbial growth. And specifically here in 9.1, we're going to be taking a look at how microbes grow. So when we're talking about microbes, what we're going to be talking about here are, in general, uh, bacteria and archaea. So um, some other things grow in this way, but we're specifically going to be taking a look at prokaryotes, um, bacteria, and archaea. So um, prokaryotes, first of all, are always asexual. Uh, so always asexual. And so they actually go through a process, uh, a couple of different processes. The one that we see most often is called binary fission. So we are going to take a look at binary fission. So again, this is the most common mechanism. So most common mechanism, mechanism of cell replication. And the first part, what we start with, is kind of similar to mitosis or meiosis in that the cell is going to grow. So the cell grows, and as it's growing, what it's doing is it's incre increasing the number of cell components. So it's increasing and making copies of all of the stuff inside of the cell. Um, so increases oops, cell components. And this is, of course, it's going to be making copies of all these things so that it can give these copies to the daughter cell. So in step one, the cell is kind of growing. It's increasing its metabolism. It's making copies of all of its cellular components. And then in step two, it's going to replicate. So it's replicating its DNA. So step one, it's going to make copies of everything. And step two, it's going to replicate its DNA. Um, when it is replicating its DNA, it's going to start at something called the origin of replication. So it uh, starts at the origin of replication. And so this is the location on, remember, its chromosome is a circular chromosome, or most of them. There are a couple of exceptions, but most um, have circular chromosomes. I'll put that up here, too. So circular chromosomes. And so on the circular chromosome, we have this origin of replication. And this is where all of the proteins are going to, or the enzymes are going to attach. And then that's where it is also attached to the inner membrane. And it's going to begin replication or begin copying the DNA. Um, so we'll say it's the location on the circular chromosome. where it is attached to the inner membrane. And so then this is where it's going to start. <clears throat> and then it's going to replicate in opposite directions until it reaches the terminus. And so basically until it gets back to kind of that origin of replication. So replication goes in opposite directions until the terminus. Then in step three, this is where we have cytokinesis. So this is similar to mitosis and meiosis. This is the division of the cytoplasm. Division of the cytoplasm. And so we have this kind of really enlarged cell because we have increased all the cellular components. We've also replicated the DNA. So we have this really enlarged cell is now going to constrict in the center. It's going to continue constricting until two daughter cells form. And then each of them will have other cell components as well as a copy of the genome. So this uh, enlarged cell constricts until two daughter cells are formed.
each with a copy of the genome. Now this constriction is actually done by a protein. <clears throat> and this protein is FTSZ. So FTSZ. And then this is the protein that's going to direct this process of cytokinesis. So protein that directs the process of cytokinesis. And so then this FTS, these proteins or, you know, a combination of all these different types of proteins come together and they assemble into a ring um, on the cytoplasmic membrane. Uh, so they form this ring kind of in the center and then this Z ring, as it's called, uh, is going to be the thing that is going, <coughs> excuse me, be the thing that is going to be constricting. Um, so it's going to be constricting and constricting and, and pulling closer to itself. I oftentimes think of it as a belt, for example. So you take the opposite end of the belt, the end, end, end of the belt, and then put it through the metal piece of the belt. And then you can picture putting that on a giant cell, and then you just pull that end piece through the metal clasp portion, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, until eventually it pinches those two cells in two. So the FTSZ assembles into this ring uh, on the cytoplasmic membrane, and then the Z ring is going to define this division plane. So it's where it's going to pull in. So additional proteins are then added to this Z ring, and then this is called a divisome. So then this divisome is going to become activated and it builds up the peptidoglycan that's going to form the septum. And then the septum is that cell wall or the beginning of the cell wall that's going to be separating those two cells. Um, so we have the cytoplasm that's going to be pinching and then at the same time we have the, sep the septum is going to be forming by that divisome. So we have that septum that's going to grow into the cell wall for the daughter cells. And then we also have the cytoplasm with the FTZ, FTSZ proteins or the Z ring that are, that's separating and dividing up that cytoplasm. So let's go ahead and write that down. We're going to say that the FTSZ assembles into a ring on the cytoplasmic membrane. And then this Z ring defines the division plane. Between the daughter cells. So this is going to tell us where that division plane is going to be, where we're going to separate the two different cells. Um, and then secondly, then there are additional proteins that are added. So additional proteins added to the Z-ring to form the divisome. So then this divisome is going to be activated or activates rather. So the divisome activates and then builds peptidoglycan. Pet, I missed some letters here. Let me go back here. Peptidoglycan to form a septum. And then this is what's going to separate the structures. Or rather, this is the structure that's going to be separating the cells. So separate cells. This is the structure that's going to do that. <clears throat> so then, step four, the cell's outer, layer, outer layers are assembled. So if you take a look in the book, I think that they do a good job of illustrating this. So just kind of in simple terms, if we're talking about binary fission, we have our cell, and then inside of our cell we have our DNA, which is circular DNA here. Um, the red here is going to be our origin of replication. 
So step number one, remember that our cell is going to get larger and larger because it's going to be making more of those cellular components. Um, and then we have our DNA, our chromosome, still there. So we're going to increase the cell. We're increasing the cellular components. It's growing. It's metabolizing. Um, then it's going to go through the next step. And our larger cell is going to be replication. So we are going to have cell replication start at this origin, this kind of red area here. And then we are going to make a copy of the DNA. So now we have two copies of the DNA. So cell replication or DNA replication rather is step two. And then in step three, we have cytokinesis. <clears throat> so then in cytokinesis, we can see this long cell is going to start to divide in. So I'm actually going to do it over here. So again, we're going to see this kind of separation pulling in here. And that's because we have this ring of proteins in here, the FTSZ proteins, FTSZ ring or the Z ring, is going to be pulling in on the plasma membrane here. So if I kind of took my eraser, I could get rid of some of this stuff in here because what we're doing is we're pulling in on that plasma membrane. And that's that right in here, these proteins. This is the FTSZ proteins or the Z ring. Um, so that's pulling in on the plasma membrane here. Our chromosomes are going to be moving opposite directions here to get out of the way as that's pulling through. Um, then we have our divisome is going to be formed with the addition of proteins to that Z ring. Then that divisome is going to activate and build peptidoglycan. So then as this is kind of pulling in still, let's see in my other drawing here, we have the DNA with their origin of replication. And then we have this pulling in already with the Z ring. And so then we have this kind of indentation in the sides here, invagination in the sides here. <clears throat> And then in the middle, we have our septum forming. So that's kind of our wall of peptidoglycan that's forming in there. So we have the FTSZ ring that's pulled that chromosome, or pulled, not the chromosome, cytoplasm, pulled the cytoplasm together, kind of pinching it apart. Then we have our green here indicated, our septum. And then that's going to grow longer and longer and longer. Uh, and then as that septum grow, grows, it's actually helping to separate these cells. So then what happens is then this cell over here and this cell over here both have all of that same information. <clears throat> so now we have two daughter cells. All right, so that kind of summarizes uh, binary fission. Now let's talk about how long this takes. So we, we just walked through it. <clears throat> Oops, let's fix my color here. So we're now going to talk about generation time. So when we talk about generation time, we can talk about this in general terms. So in general terms, this is the time between the same point in the life cycle in two successive generations. So the time between the same point of the life cycle in two successive generations. So when we talk about humans, the, the text even gives it as an example. For humans, it's about 25 years. So when we think of generation time for organisms, for humans, we would say when we would look at that same point in the life cycle and the same point in the life cycle that we often look at is birth, for example. Um, so the average time or the um, generation time for humans is about 25 years. Now, when we talk about prokaryotes, prokaryotes are much, much faster. Fortunately, because it would be really, really difficult to study them if their generation time was 25 years. So <clears throat> our prokaryotic life cycles or generation times is also called the doubling time. So when you hear the term generation time or doubling time, that's going to mean the same thing. 
And that's, of course, because it's the time that it takes for the population to go through one round of binary fission. And if the population is going through one round of binary fission, then they are doubling um, their population. So the time it takes for the population to double through one round of binary fission. So generation time or doubling time. And when we talk about generation time or doubling time, it can vary greatly. So in our laboratory, we use E. coli pretty often, and that takes about 20 minutes. <clears throat> so we oftentimes will incubate E. coli broth cultures or E. coli cultures in general for only about 24 to 48 hours. Otherwise, they're going to start running out of nutrients in our agar or broth. Um, so it takes about 20 minutes. Some other things can take hours. Some other things can take days. So it depends on the organism. And it's important to know this if you are utilizing these organisms in the laboratory. So um, knowing the generation time is going to help in knowing what to expect um, in a certain amount of days so that you can plan out um, the research accordingly. Um, and also then you can know when is a good time to utilize those organisms because as we're going to see in a moment when we talk about the growth curve, we want to use them while they're healthy and they're multiplying. So let's take a look at that growth curve I just mentioned. <clears throat> so the growth curve. So when we talk about the growth curve of a particular organism, specifically when we're talking about microorganisms or, or bacteria, what we're talking about is a closed or a batch culture. So a closed or a batch culture. And what this means is that we're not adding any nutrients. So no nutrients are added and waste is not removed. And we can say that most waste is not removed because some waste might be removed just by the nature of the organism, They're meaning that gas, for example. Um, so gas can build up within the culture, but then it will likely be released, especially if we're talking about incubating something in our laboratory, for example. When we have our test tube caps and they're slightly loosened, we are able to release that gas. So that's some waste uh, from bacteria, but most of the waste is not removed, meaning any of the other... Um, chemical compounds or molecules that are produced uh, as waste products by the bacteria. So a growth curve is, as we just mentioned, takes place where we add, we don't add any nutrients and we don't take any waste away. Um, but when we actually talk about the curve itself, this is going to be a graph that's going to model the number of cells in a culture over time. So um, a graph models the number of cells in a culture over time. And we can have specific growth curves um, for specific organisms, but we're going to be looking at the growth curve just in general and the different terms associated with it. Uh, so before we do that though, let's take a look at the term culture density. So the culture density is the number of cells per volume. Uh, this is something that we will calculate in a lab that we'll be doing. But in the graph, as we take a look at this, <clears throat> when we're talking about culture density, we're talking about the overall cell population, population for a closed system. Because remember, what we're talking about here is a closed culture, a closed or a batch culture, which means that we have a closed system, we're not adding or taking anything away, and so then the population or the cell population for a closed system is our culture density, which is the number of cells per volume. So if, we have, if we're taking the entire volume, we can calculate the culture density at any point in the process, um, and then that's going to be the number of cells per volume, and we'll take a look at how we can measure those things in just a little bit. Um, but let's take a look at our growth curve first. So on one side here, we have the number of living cells. And this is logarithmic. And then on this side here, we have time. Uh, so again, general. And so our growth curve is going to look something like this, where we start out 
pretty flat, and then we increase exponentially, and then we plateau a bit, and then we decrease exponentially. So then we're going to talk about each of the steps in this process. So we have the first one here. Let's talk about what that is. So in number one, that is called the lag phase. So the lag phase is where we have just inoculated the broth. So if let's um, talk about this growth term or growth curve in terms of broth culture. So if we're in our laboratory, we are going to take a test tube. It's going to have broth in it. And what we're going to do is we're going to inoculate that broth with some, let's say, E. coli. And then what we're going to do is we can take a look at the growth curve or how it's going to grow. So the very first portion is the lag phase. So this is where we have an, an inoculum. And that inoculum is just added. Uh, so the inoculum is a small number of cells at the beginning of a growth curve. that are added to a fresh culture medium. So our inoculum. So if you think about it in terms of our laboratory, uh, you may be taking your inoculating loop and grabbing a couple of cells or a couple of dozen of cells uh, from our culture and then putting it into the broth tube and kind of swishing it around. And that is the inoculum that small number of cells that you've just introduced into our broth. So in this case, then in this lag phase, so this part right here, the lag phase, the number of cells is not changing. Number of cells do not change. And you can see that, of course, because we're straight here, uh, parallel to the, the bottom line here. Um, so there's no increase. So the number of living cells over here, the number of living cells stays the same. So the cell, the number of cells doesn't change. At this point, however, what is happening is that the cells are going to enlarge and they're metabolically active. So the cells enlarge and are metabolically active. So at this point, basically what we're saying is that we are repairing cells. <clears throat> so repairing them from the move, from where they started. So the original stock culture. Once the cells get placed into the new broth culture, they are released into this broth culture and they're happy, right? So they're now they're swimming around in this wonderfully high nutrient density broth culture and they're going to be metabolically active. So they're going to start pulling in all of those wonderful nutrients you just put them in. Uh, they're going to be going through the process of um, utilizing those nutrients in order to make energy and then they are enlarging. So they're getting nice and happy and utilizing all of the things that you've just placed them in. <clears throat> At this point, if there were any cells that were damaged, so if part of their cell wall kind of got broken up when you were grabbing um, from the stock culture, then those are going to happen. So they're repairing um, any damaged cells. And then they're becoming metabolically active. So metabolically active and, and repairing and, and they're happy. They're just... Um, just placed into something really fantastic for them. <clears throat> so the duration of this, uh, the duration of this lag phase depends on various things. So duration depends on, and then we can say, so first of all, we already mentioned species type. It also depends on the genetic makeup of the cells. It depends on the composition of the medium. So how much of how much of the different components are in the medium. So, so the components in the medium or composition of the medium. And then the size of the inoculum, of course. Mm -hmm. 
So that is our lag phase, which is basically just the cells are being reintroduced or being not reintroduced, but introduced into this wonderful broth medium, for example. They're surrounded by nutrients. They start to repair whatever damage might have been done. They start to take in all those nutrients, and then they're happily being metabolically active and starting to enlarge themselves and make lots of copies of the cellular components. This next portion here, number two, is called the log phase. So let's talk about number two. So number two is the log phase. And then in the log phase, the reason it's log is because it's short for logarithmic. Logarithmic growth. So log phase, logarithmic growth. So at this point, the cells are actively dividing. So cells are actively, actively dividing. And then this would be by binary fission. So this is logarithmic, right? So the number of cells, uh, number of cells increases exponentially. So it appears linear um, based on the graph and the way that we draw the graph, but really this is exponential <clears throat> because really what we would be looking at is something that's more like this. Um, but when we graph it the way that we graph it, it ends up looking something like this. But if you think about what's actually happening um, when cells divide, we start with one and then that ends up being two, but now each of these two ends up being two and then each of these ends up being two. So the growth is exponential or logarithmic. <clears throat> so we have a, a very quick rate. So here we had one, two, three generations, and we went from one single cell in the first generation to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cells just in three generations. Um, which is a huge number. And if you think about that going down further for dozens and dozens of generations, we're talking about a, a very large number of cells. Uh, so that's why this is what is happening in the log phase, is that we have all of these cells that are happily using all of these nutrients, and then they're actively dividing by binary fission. Um, so we have something that is called the intrinsic growth rate. Intrinsic growth rate. And so the intrinsic growth rate is the generation time under specific growth conditions for a specific species. So let me write that down first. So generation time under specific growth conditions for a specific species. So if we think about this, we already mentioned E. coli. <clears throat> e. coli's generation time is about 20 minutes. Now that's under specific growth conditions. So if we place E. coli in a 37 degrees Celsius incubator, their generation time is about 20 minutes. Now if we left E. coli out on the table, um, which is generally about 30 degrees C, then it's going to not be 20 minutes. It would be longer than 20 minutes. Um, if we put it in something perhaps that's slightly warmer than 37 degrees, it might go even faster. Now, however, if we get too much warmer than that, say we get into like 45, 50 or so, then it's going to slow down again because it'll be too hot for the organism. So our growth rate, our intrinsic growth rate, is the generation time with given our specific growth conditions and given the specific species, right? So if we start out with E. coli, which is about 20 minutes at 37 degrees C, but then if we talk about something else that has already a four to six hour generation time at its peak, at its, at its ideal conditions, then of course, if we take it out of its ideal conditions, then it's going to be changed or adjusted dramatically. So we have these ideas of these intrinsic growth rates based on specific species. And we can utilize those again in the laboratory to see what we expect to have at certain times at certain conditions. So cells actually have a constant growth rate in this phase. So again, we're talking about log phase. Um, 
During log phase, they have a constant growth rate and there's just uniform activity. Um, so we can kind of guess where they would be. So again, given our example of E. coli and knowing that every 20 minutes we're doubling the population, if we know the number of cells that we put in to start with, then we could calculate at what point we may want to take it out of the incubator because we have the number of cells we're looking for, um, just as an example. So <clears throat> cells have a constant growth rate at this phase and uniform activity. So when the culture is at the log phase, this is when we want to use them in the laboratory. Um, so these cells are preferentially used. So when we are utilizing organisms in the laboratory, our attempts are to use them while they're in the log phase because at this point they're happy, they're metabolizing, they're growing, and if they're happy and metabolizing and growing, then we can utilize them to study. So they are more apt to um, be used for uh, studies in this way because they are healthy at this point, if they're healthy and growing. Um, because you know at this point if you're, you're taking out bacteria that they're going to be in the best possible condition. And then we'll see in a moment why the other phases are not happiest. Um, so this is also the phase where bacteria cells are most susceptible um, to disinfectants and antibiotics um, because they are in this happy growth phase. So a uh, phase where cells are most susceptible to disinfectants and antibiotics. And that's because these some of these disinfectant and antibiotics are going to disrupt oops, disrupt protein, DNA, and cell wall synthesis. So if our antibiotics are designed to stop bacteria from making proteins or stop bacteria from making copies of its DNA or stop bacteria from um, synthesizing its cell wall, then this is when we want to give that antibiotic because this is when it would be useful. Because this, again, is when they are going through growth. This is when they're metabolically active. So this is when they're making proteins. This is when they're making DNA for replication or for division. This is when they're making cell walls while they're dividing. Uh, so this is when we really want to catch these bacteria and give antibiotics or spray with disinfectants or other disinfectants in order to stop the growth from happening. So our log phase is a pretty important phase. Now if we go back up to our graph here, we're up at step number three here, and in step number three, this is called the stationary phase. So in this phase, as its name implies, things kind of stay the same. So stationary, meaning at this point, our waste has increased, so we have a buildup of waste. Our food has decreased, so we have a decreased amount of nutrients or food. If it is an oxygen-requiring organism, the oxygen has decreased. Uh, so for aerobes, our oxygen has decreased. And so then, because of each of these things, now at this point we have a decrease in the growth rate. So decrease in growth rate and it'll go all the way down to zero where they are no longer growing at all. Um, so this is when the total number of cells is no longer changing and so we have this plateau. <clears throat> so total number of cells not changing. And then we have our plateau. So in this case, what we say then is that the number of new cells is equal to the number of cells that are dying. <clears throat> 
So we have this equilibrium here. So we're running out of food. We have an increase of waste. We're running out of oxygen, if that's necessary for aerobes. And so then the number of cells that are forming is equal to the number of cells that are dying. So the number of cells that are going through binary fission. So if they happen to still have some nutrients around them, perhaps they're still dividing. But at that same point, um, other cells that are nearby don't have those nutrients, and so they're dying. So our culture density here is pretty much not changing. So if we use those terms, culture density is not changing in general, so generally. <clears throat> and so then we can also say that at this point, our carrying capacity, carrying capacity is at max culture density. So we are at max culture density. We can't handle any more growth um, as a whole. Of course, as I said, there are still new cells being formed, those that happen to have access to nutrients, but at the same time we have cells that are dying. So at this point, the cells are switching into survival mode. So cells switch into survival mode. And this means that they are no longer making new items, so meaning they're not making proteins anymore, they're not making DNA anymore, <clears throat> uh, they're not making their cell walls anymore. So since they're not making these things, now at this point they're less susceptible to agents that will disrupt synthesis of these items. <clears throat> so synthesis of those items. So at this point, if the bacterial culture is at the stationary phase and we give them antibiotics or if we give them um, or spray them with certain disinfectants, then they're less susceptible. So some will still be damaged by them, um, but others won't because they're in this survival mode. And while they're in this survival mode, this is when we see sporulation occurring. Um, if applicable, if applicable. And that's because not all organisms sporulate. Um, but if they do, then likely this is when they're going to start to sporulate because they're recognizing that there's an increase in waste, which is not ideal. They're recognizing that there's a decrease in their food source or nutrients, uh, which is not ideal. So then they're going to start to go through sporulation. At this point, we also have secondary metabolites that are made. And we see an expression of their virulence factors. So expression of virulence factors. And this is um, because they're in this mode, right? They're trying to survive. And since they're trying to survive, they're going to start making these products that are going to contribute to it surviving. So it's going to start to make these virulence factors to help it to reproduce and it causes disease. So virulence factors are products that contribute to a microbe's Ability to survive, reproduce, and cause disease. So these virulence factors really are just to give them an advantage because they say they're running out of nutrients, they're running out of space, they're running out of um, oxygen perhaps. And so then what they're trying to do is they start to produce these virulence factors that are going to help them to survive, um, help them to reproduce. And then they do in fact start cause disease. Well, that's why they're called virulence factors. So after the stationary phase, if we move back up to our graph, so we've started here, the lag phase, then we have the log phase, then we are at the stationary phase, and now here we are at number four, which is the death phase. <clears throat> so in number four, we'll just go all the way down here, and number four is the death phase. So at this point, that's when we have the waste is so high, waste is so high, it's now toxic. Uh, 
and there's no food left. So at this point, there's so much waste in the broth culture, for example, that it's starting to affect the cells that are living. Um, and then also, since there's no food left, all of the nutrients have been used up, then they don't have anything to metabolize, so they're starting to die. Then at this point, the number of cells are decreasing exponentially. So again, when we saw in our log phase, we saw an increase, a logarithmic growth. In this case, we're seeing logarith logarithmic death. Um, that said, as these cells are dying, so cell lysis, which is when the cells are dying, um, they can occur, or that can occur, to give food to survivors. Now, some of these survivors are going to hang out, and then what they end up being called is persister cells. So these are cells with a slow metabolic rate. So in this case, in our death phase, what we see is, of course, the waste is now so high, it's become toxic, there's no food left, so the cells are starting to die off. They don't have any food. Uh, so they're going to die, and they're surrounded by toxins. So then at this point, the number of cells are decreasing exponentially, and then as the cell lysis occurs, then these cells are kind of bursting their ingredients, their parts, out into the environment. And as they're bursting their parts out into the environment, some other cells that are around may start to utilize some of the components that were in those cells that died. And so then those cells are going to slowly metabolize those items, and then they can hang out for longer, and those are persister cells. So those persister cells could hang out long enough, the hope is for them, to hang out long enough until more nutrients are introduced or waste is removed so that they can continue metabolizing and then start to go through binary fission again. Now, if you hold on to a bacterial culture for many, many weeks or months, those persister cells will die off as well because they have a slow metabolic rate, but it, they still have to be metabolically active. Unless, of course, they have gone through sporulation. So if they've gone through sporulation, then the spores can hang out there indefinitely. So that is the last piece to our growth curve. So if we go back up here, remember that in step number one here, we have our lag phase. <clears throat> so in step number one, we have our lag phase, which is where we have taken the inoculum, those couple of cells or a couple of dozen cells, and put them into the new um, broth or ag agar plate, whatever it is that we're talking about, wherever we're growing these cells. And so the number of cells, cells stay the same for a certain period of time. And this, be, this is because they're repairing themselves, they're kind of getting adjusted to their environment, they're starting to metabolize, and so they're starting to create or build up all of the components inside of themselves. And then we go into step number two, which is the log phase. And the log phase is where we see exponential growth, uh, lots of nutrients, lots of division, um, increase in cells. Then we have the stationary phase in number three here, which is where everything kind of evens out. The number of cells that are going through binary fission are about equal to the number of cells that are dying, and that's because we have an increase in waste and a decrease in nutrients. And then that increase in waste starts to take over to where then it's toxic to the cells. They start to die off, and they have a serious lack of nutrients, so they start to die off. And then we get back to uh, our zero point or very low number. And the reason I say very low number is because we may have some of those persister cells hanging around for a while um, and or we may have um, spores that are hanging out. Because remember in uh, our stationary phase here, this is when the cells would notice that toxins are building up, nutrients are going down. Now it's time to go through sporulation to protect themselves. Now, if we wanted to keep things happy if we wanted to sustain microbial growth. So sustain microbial growth. Then what we would need to do is to go back a couple of stages here and make sure that we're getting rid of the waste, right? Because that's what gets us into the stationary phase is an increase in waste. So we want to be able to be removing, so removing waste. And then we also want to be increasing or adding uh, food, right, nutrients. So adding nutrients. 
And we can do that in a couple of ways. One example is using something called a chemostat. And a chemostat is an apparatus that continuously adds nutrients and then removes waste. So apparatus that continuously adds nutrients and removes waste. Another way to do this is by subculturing or reculturing. So um, knowing information about your particular species that you are working with or species that you're working with, you can know the generation time or the doubling time, and then you can know about how many nutrients you have or how, how much of your broth you have, for example, and then you want to make sure that you are going to inoculate a new medium every so often uh, to make sure that the cells are continuously in an exponential state, exponential growth state, uh, meaning the log phase, so that any anytime you're using that particular organism, they're in their happiest state. Now, I just mentioned the broth and knowing the generation time um, and knowing how many bacterial cells you have in there, for example, based on the broth. And that gets us into our next section, which is measuring. So how do we know these things? So measuring bacterial growth. So our number of bacteria is going to indicate the extent of infection. So if we're talking about not in a laboratory like us, we, can, we might want to measure bacterial growth because of you know, if it's in a laboratory, a medical laboratory, and somebody brings in a sample, it's going to indicate how infected a person is, the extent of the infection. Um, so we might want to know the number of bacteria in a laboratory so we know kind of where we're at with nutrients or uh, if we're still in the log phase, that kind of thing. But in a medical laboratory, then it helps to know the extent of infection. So number of bacteria... extent of infection. And we can measure these in two ways. So one is directly. And this, you know, by directly, what we mean is counting cells. So we can count the cells we can measure directly. Uh, second way is indirectly. And when we say indirectly, what we're saying is we're going to measure the cell presence by measuring something else. So measure cell presence by measuring something else. So we are going to take a look at some examples of direct cell counting and indirect cell counting. So that'll be made more clear as we move forward. So if we look closer at direct cell count, when we talk about um, direct cell count, one example is the direct microscopic cell count. So just long form here. Direct microscopic cell count. So in this case, what we're going to do is we'll transfer a known volume of a culture. So we'll measure out, say, a half a milliliter of a culture to a calibrated slide. Um, so oftentimes it's smaller than a half a milliliter. It would be something like a quarter of a milliliter or um, something even much smaller, like 100 microliters, for example. That will be placed on a calibrated slide or, or a Petroff-Hauser chamber, a counting chamber. All of those are the same thing for, or uh, the different terms for the same thing. And then basically, as its name implies, counting the cells under light microscope. Uh, so what we would do is we would transfer a known volume of a culture to a calibrated slide. And some of the other terms that were used are a counting slide or a Petroff Hauser. Oh, I have space here. Slide, or chamber, not slide, sorry. I'll do it over here anyway. Chamber. And <clears throat> counting the cells. 
under a light microscope. So this is going to allow for the calculation of a specific volume. So we know a specific volume, we can make it a very small volume, and then we can put it on one of these counting slides or petroff hauser chambers, and then we can actually make a count. So the reason that these are used is because they're not just like your typical slide and then you have your smear of bacteria, maybe you have a cover here. In the case of these calibrated slides or these counting slides, um, what we have is the slide, but etched into the slide is a graph here. And then what we do is we add our uh, broth here, <coughs> our known volume of culture, uh, and then when we look at it through the light microscope, we can count the bacteria. We can count the bacteria in several of the squares, and then what we can do is we can calculate um, how much is in our entire volume based on the average number in this volume. Um, so if we have 100 microliter volume here and say we count 100, well, it wouldn't be 100, let's say we count something like 350 cells, then we can use that information the 350 cells over 100 microliters volume. And we can do our math over here for how many cells per, you know, I don't know, 1,000 microliters, a milliliter. <clears throat> and then we know how many are in there. Or if we wanted to think of our um, test tubes in there, we could do over 5 milliliters, which would be 5,000 microliters. So then we could calculate, right? So we could calculate the number of cells that would be in the entire volume, so we would know. Um, so this is a direct cell count. <clears throat> so in this case, what we would do then, I can write it down in words here, is uh, counts must be made in several cell, or in several, yeah, there's cells, in several cells, that, which is one of these squares here, <clears throat> and averaged. So some advantages, um, advantages to this method is that it's easy, right? You just, you know, pipette a little bit on there, look at it through the light microscope, do some counting, and then multiply. It's fast because of that same process. It's inexpensive. Slides are relatively cheap. But disadvantages is that it's not very good for dilute cultures. So if we are putting something like um, 100 microliters on the slide and it's a very, very dilute culture and we only have like a, a couple of cells, then that's not going to give us a very good average to calculate up from. And also it is hard to distinguish, hard to distinguish between living cells and dead cells and other debris. Um, between living or dead cells or debris. So then we might wanna do something else. So we might wanna do something else including a viability stain. In the case of a viability stain, we actually utilize two different stains. And so we do our primary stain. And with our primary stain, this is going to be a fluorescent green. And this fluorescent green is going to bind to nucleic acids. Then we apply a secondary stain. And with the secondary stain, what we see whoops, is it is fluorescent red. And this fluorescent red is going to stain only if the cytoplasmic membrane is severely damaged. So only if cytoplasmic plasmic membrane is severely damaged. Um, and this is because that red stain is only going to be able to infiltrate that plasma membrane if it is damaged. 
Um, so if we utilize these stains and then we do a direct cell count, we can see where we have our nucleic acids, our green nucleic acid, which means that something's alive. Um, and then we'll have our secondary stain, uh, which is where we have our um, red stain, which is only when the cells are damaged. Um, so we can tell if something is debris because neither the primary stain or the secondary stain uh, is on them. But then also the secondary stain is only going to be there if the cell membrane is broken or disrupted or severely damaged, which means that would be a dead cell. So that's something that one wouldn't count then because you're trying to count the number of living cells in a particular volume. Another example of a direct cell count would be a Coulter counter. And a Coulter counter is an electronic counting device. And what this does is it has an electrical current um, that's going between a positive and a negative within this kind of test tube device. And this current then is going to allow these bacteria to move through the current and every time a bacteria moves through the current it's going to change the electrical resistance uh, and then that is counting it. So an electronic counting device that counts the change in electrical resistance. in a oops, saline solution. So the cells are going to interrupt the current. The current one by one. One by one. As they enter the inner chamber. So the inner chamber, let's see what that is. So we have kind of this test tube device here that has an outer chamber, and then we have this inner chamber. Uh, so this continues to go up, you know, until we have the top of our test tube. So then uh, what we have are different electrodes in here coming down here, and then this is, say, our, our negative end, and then over here, we have our positive end. <clears throat> so then we have this current. And then this is saline solution in here. So saline solution, um, something that's going to hold a current or be able to have a current going through it. <clears throat> so we have the current, and then that's going between these two things here. And so then when we have bacteria that's out here floating around in the outer uh, chamber here, then as that bacteria goes through this little tiny hole and back into this inner chamber, into the inner chamber, it's going to disrupt that current. It's going to change the resistance and then that counts it. Um, so the key here is that this space right here is very, very small. So it's only going to allow one bacterium through at a time. Now, this is a disadvantage in a way. So a disadvantage is that it's not good for concentrated samples. Not good for concentrated samples. And that's because if we have such concentrated samples that we have many, many, many bacteria kind of forcing its way through, it's not going to give us an accurate reading. Um, so that can be difficult if there's a lot of bacteria in the sample. Also, it's not going to discriminate discriminate between living and dead cells. So it's just this change in resistance. So we can have debris or we can have dead cells or living cells moving through there and it's going to count it. Now the advantage is, advantages, uh, is that it's fast, right? So add some saline solution, add your, um, your bacteria and then set it up and let it roll. <clears throat> so it's fast, it's also accurate because it does have this really tiny small space that it's fast, you can set it up very quickly 
Uh, you don't have to sit there and actually count the cells yourself. The machine does it for you. And then it is accurate um, unless it's concentrated because those bacteria are going to go through one by one and it's going to count them one by one. <clears throat> so the only problem here, of course, then is that it's not discriminating between living and dead. Um, so you want to only count viable cells. We really only want viable cells or live cells. So that is definitely a downfall. But, of course, we wouldn't have um, a lot of dead cells if we took it you know, more toward the end of the growth curve. We would have more living cells if we took it toward the beginning of the growth curve. But if we're trying to determine where in the growth curve we are, this would not be an effective method. So the next type of direct cell count that we are going to talk about is called a plate count. So a plate count. And this is done very, very often in, in different variations on this. So what we're doing here, as this is a direct cell count, is we are counting the number of viable cells. So count uh, of viable cells. And in this case, what we're saying is that each cell, so each viable cell, <clears throat> can produce a colony. which is something that's visible. So if we take a look at our, our agar plates, if we take a look at our agar slants, um, we can see that there, there is visible growth. And so what we're saying is that each cell can produce what's called a colony that is visible. <clears throat> and so then we can count that. Now the units that we use when we do a plate count are called colony, colony forming units colony forming units or CFUs per milliliter. Uh, so that's going to be, if we're doing a plate count, then at the end what we'll end up with is some certain number of CFUs per milliliter. So a CFU could come from uh, two cells that land on a, on a particular spot and grow. Um, it could come from cells that are difficult to disperse, so something like a, a chain or a cluster of cells. So it's not incredibly accurate um, because, so a CFU could be uh, two cells that land in, same, in the same spot. Now we try when we're doing um, isolation of cultures, we try very, very hard to kind of separate things out and we do that in a particular way um, by <clears throat> when we are inoculating the agar plate, separating it into our quadrants and starting out with our inoculation here and then just dragging some into the second one, dragging some into the third and then dragging some into the fourth. So by the time we get into this fourth quadrant, the idea is, is that we've been able to drag a single cell uh, or single cells that will be so separate that it will really only be one single cell that has started a colony. So this growth right here is called the colony. Now that doesn't always happen. So we could still by accident have two cells or more that land in that single spot and form a colony. <clears throat> so then what we would likely do, just kind of moving forward, is take that colony and then probably do the same thing, grow it up again, um, and then try to spread it out again to make sure that we try to get a single individual cell that has started a colony. Um, or again, <clears throat> uh, it could be that cells that are difficult, cells that are difficult, difficult to disperse. So again, something like uh, chains or clusters that might be very difficult to kind of spread apart even if we're doing an isolation of cultures. So a CFU or a colony forming unit isn't marked really as a single cell that has grown that. Um, and that's why we don't have a number of cells per milliliter count. Instead we have what's a colony forming unit per milliliter to account for that kind of um, issue if that happens. Um, also, some cells are viable um, but unculturable. <clears throat> so plant counts are considered low estimates. Um, so they're good estimates, but they're a little bit low or some on the low side. So uh, we can put some cells are viable but unculturable. So considered low estimates. But that doesn't mean it's not used. It's actually used quite often because it's one of the most effective or easiest methods. <clears throat>
<clears throat> so when we are doing a plate count, uh, what we want is we want to have a count that is between 30 and 300 colonies. So when we're doing that, if we have less than 30 on a particular plate, then it's not statistically relevant. Uh, so not statistically relevant. So we wouldn't count that because uh, it's just way too low to give us an actual idea of the number of CFUs in a particular volume. On the other hand, if it's greater than 300, it's too hard to count. Too hard to count. Um, and so what we'll be having in that situation is if there's more than 300, um, then there will be colonies that are overlapping, and so we wouldn't be able to count them very clearly. That would be closer to something like a bacterial lawn that's coating the entire um, plate. Um, so too hard to count, but even if they're not on top of each other or closer to a bacterial lawn, just counting that many units inside of a plate is just very difficult and you can lose track and things like that. So what we want to aim for in a plate in order to give us a good CFU per milliliter, somewhere between 30 and 300 colonies. So the way that we are going to get a plate that has something between 30 and 300 colonies <clears throat> is by doing something called a serial dilution. So our serial dilution is where we're going to take our volume, or take our uh, sample, and what we are going to do is we are going to dilute it one right after another, so serial, um, meaning a series. And so then once we do that, we're going to have various kind of percentages. So we usually do this in, in uh, multiples of 10, so that it is simple math, basically. So we do it multiples of 10, so that's a little bit easier to calculate or back calculate, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the number of serial dilutions is chosen just on a kind of a preliminary estimate of the culture density. So um, one might see that if they're growing something in a broth and it's very, very, very thick, uh, it's very cloudy, so likely there's a lot of growth in it, then they might do something like a series of 10 or 20 serial dilutions. Um, but if it's a very uh, lightly cloudy broth, a person might do only five serial dilutions just to make sure that they somehow get a plate that has something between 30 and 300 colonies. <clears throat> so we can say the number of serial dilutions is chosen based on a preliminary estimate of culture density. So again, it's me preliminary estimate just meaning taking a look at how cloudy it is, for example, and then deciding based on that how many to do. And then if you do do that and we still end up with something with say less than 30 on every plate or more than 300 on every plate, then one would know to go back to that stock solution and do more serial dilutions or larger dilutions. <clears throat> so then what one would do would be to continue the dilution until you have a series that will cover that desired concentration range, so between that 30 and 300 CFU. Um, and then what you would do is that in each one of these dilutions, so as we continue this dilution, this serial dilution, um, we have this series, and then we would plate a sample from each of those dilutions um, to see if it ends up growing between the 30 and 300 CFUs. Uh, so we would continue dilution until we have a series that will cover the desired concentration cover the desired concentration range so that 30 to 300 CFUs uh, and then so then each sample is plated <laughs> so um, we go through a series of dilutions, and in the text there's a great image of this, um, but we have our initial culture here in our flask, let's say, 
and it's kind of cloudy here. <clears throat> so then what we'll do for our cereal dilution is that we will have our test tube and it's going to contain nine milliliters of saline solution, for example. Um, and then what we will do is we can take from here, we can put one milliliter of the original, um, original, original sample, one milliliter of that into our nine milliliters. So this is going to equal 10 milliliters total. <clears throat> then what we'll do is we have our second test tube and in it has, again, nine milliliters of saline solution in it. Then what we'll do is after we have vortexed this, after we've added the one milliliter, we have 10 milliliters total, we vortex it. Then what we're going to do is take one milliliter from this tube and put it into the second one. So again, that's going to bring us up to a volume of 10 milliliters. We vortex that, and then we add that sample similarly to nine milliliters of saline. So we take a sample from that, and then we continue on for however many sample uh, dilutions we think we may need, again, with that preliminary guess. So then we continue on so that we get more and more and more and more dilute. So like this is a one in 10 dilution, <clears throat> this is a one in 100 dilution, a one in 1,000 dilution, a one in 10,000 dilution, and on. So then what we've done is we've really, really diluted this. And then what we do is we are going to take some from each sample and we put it on agar plates. Once we put it on agar plates, then we incubate. And once we incubate, then we see our colony forming units. So what we would see, of course, what we would expect to see anyway, is that we have a large amount of CFUs on this first plate, right? And this one would likely be greater than 300 CFUs. But then as we go down in our dilutions, <clears throat> we're going to have less and less and less of these colony forming units. And then what we're going to see is that at some point we can count something between the 30. So let's say this would be less than 30 in this one. So then both this one here and this one here, the second and third are going to be somewhere between 30 and 300. Once they're between 30 and 300, then we take that number and use it to calculate our numbers. So say 270, and let's say this one ends up being 257. So now we have our colonies that we've just counted, and then we can do our math backwards to get to our original sample with our kind of calculation, our plate count, ending up with our colony forming units per milliliter. <clears throat> Now, how did we get from our samples up here to our plates down here? There are two ways that we can do that. The first one is called the pour plate method. And in the pour plate method, as the name implies, we're going to pour it. Uh, but first what we're going to do is we're going to add the sample. Uh, so it's going to be mixed with warm <coughs> agar, so um, somewhat liquid agar, but not very, very hot. So not just out of the, the microwave, um, but because of course that would kill the bacteria, but warmed agar enough to be liquidy enough to pour. Um, and then it's going to be poured into an agar plate. And then step two, it is swirled to distribute. So it's going to be moved, you know, swirled around so it covers the entire plate. And then step three, it's going to be incubated and then count the CFUs. So pretty straightforward, the pour plate method. Um, then we have the spread plate method. And in the spread plate method, <clears throat> what we are going to do is first, the sample is going to be poured onto a already solid agar. So sample is poured on 
solid agar. So just a regular agar plate instead of having this warm agar that is then going to be poured into an empty plate and then solidified and incubated. In this case, we're going to already have a made plate and then we're going to take the sample and we're going to pour it onto the agar. Um, then what we'll do is we'll spread it around with a spreader, a sterile spreader. And then in three, we incubate and count the CFUs. So you can see that there are these two different methods and generally it depends on um, what is easiest or most efficient for the person that is doing it. Um, so if a particular, or you know, it's related to the organism or organisms that you are counting. So if you have an organism that typically likes to have lower temperatures, um, putting it into warm agar, because enough it would have to be warm enough for it to be liquid, um, pouring it into warm agar might actually kill it. So that would not be a viable method. Instead, you'd have to do the spread plate method. Um, but if you're talking about an organism that can withstand high temperatures, maybe it would just be easier to pour it into um, the agar and then do the pour plate method. So it really depends on um, the person doing the study, the, the organisms that you're studying, <clears throat> and the kind of stuff that you have available to you. So then, um, regardless of whether we're doing the pour plate method or the spread plate method, <clears throat> two to three plates will be in incubated. Or this really depends on um, how many plates you do. So it really depends on how many really serial dilutions you do where you kind of think that preliminary area might be. <clears throat> then what you're going to do is average the dilutions or average the CFUs. So when you average them, then you use that number. So up here where I was mentioning this number here and then this number here, we'll take the average of these two really and then come back up here and we'll find out our CFU per milliliter. So this is good if we have a really highly concentrated sample. <clears throat> like if we're growing something in the laboratory and it's growing very well because of course we know what we're growing and we've put it in the correct incubation uh, for the correct time and all of this is fantastic, we can then do this to dilute it to get a good count. Now on the other hand, um, what if we find out that, or what if we're in a situation where we have something that's very dilute? In this case, we can utilize something called membrane filtration technique. This is one method we could use. And in this case, what we're going to do, the first step is that we take a known volume. So like say a milliliter or 10 milliliters, and then we vacuum, filter it aseptically. through a membrane with a pore size to trap microbes. Then this membrane is placed in a plate with the medium. And then it is incubated and count the CFUs. <clears throat> so the cell density is then going to equal the cell count over the original volume filtered. Now we do have a second way that we can um, calculate the number of colonies or we can um, determine the cell count when we have a very low or likely a low number of colony forming units or cells, <clears throat> viable cells. And that's called the most probable number or the MPN. So in the most probable number, this is where we have very dilute samples. Um, so very dilute samples. 
So we can't uh, detect our viable cells with other plate count methods that we've talked about. So in this case, what we do is we are going to evaluate the growth based on detected changes in turbidity or color due to some sort of metabolic activity. So we evaluate, evaluate, <clears throat> excuse me, growth based on detectable changes in turbidity or color due to metabolic activity. So, for example, if we are trying to determine, and this is an example from the text, if we are trying to determine the number of coliforms in pond water, for example, pond water, or let's say in a pool, right, in a public pool. In this case, what we're going to do for most probable number, um, it should be pretty low. Um, coliforms are bacteria that come from fecal matter. So we want to know if there is a coliform in there or multiple coliforms, but likely it's, it's pretty low. So in order to get this, we have to know that coliforms ferment lactose. And then that changes it to lactic acid. And that can decrease a pH, right? So if we have acid being formed, acid, then it's going to decrease the pH and then it can change the indicator. So we have a pH indicator inside of our medium. <clears throat> so for example, if we start with our, our flask again, with our sample, this is our pond water, then we can do dilutions, um, but not serial dilutions the way we did it before. So instead what we'll do is we'll have several test tubes. Uh, I think the text use, uses five. Um, test tubes, and what we're going to do is we'll add 10 milliliters to each of these test tubes of the pond water. Then we'll have another set of test tubes, and in these test tubes, what we're going to add is one milliliter of the pond water in each of them. And then our last set of test tubes, what we're going to do is we're going to add 0 0.1 milliliters of the pond water. So the idea is then we can add that, add you know 10 milliliters, one milliliter, and 0.1 milliliter to this solution. In this solution, we have, again, a pH indicator <clears throat> in the medium. So in here, we have nutrients for the cells to grow that they're going to like, and then we have the pH indicator. And then, of course, now we've added the pond water. So then we can incubate these things these test tubes, incubate them, and then when they come out, we have our five of each of them. And when they come out, we'll say that the 10 milliliters, they are all yellow. Here with our one milliliter, we find that there are two that have turned yellow. And then down here, none of them have turned yellow. So then we have five out of five up here, two out of five here, and zero out of five here. And then we can check this ratio in a chart. And then that's going to tell us, and for this example they tell us, it's about 49 bacteria per 100 milliliters is the estimate. And that is based on the chart in the text. Um, and so then these would be something that can be looked up. So this is our kind of standard. Um, after doing this most probable number, we can go back to what we're looking for, and then that can give us, okay, this is, since you have five out of five, two out of five, and zero out of five, given these dilutions, then you probably have 49 bacteria per, per 100 milliliters. Then that gives us um, our answer for here. So that is our last um, direct cell count method that we are going to talk about. Now what we're going to do is we'll talk briefly about our indirect cell counts. So indirect cell counts. <clears throat>
methods. Um, so just quickly, we're going to talk a, about a couple of these. These are a little bit less um, ordered out, uh, a little bit less detailed. Um, so first of all, we can look at turbidity. So turbidity is the cloudiness of the solution, cloudiness of the liquid suspension Oops, of bacteria. Uh, so that's our turbidity. <clears throat> and then what we can do is we can, use, we can measure this cloudiness um, with a spectrophotometer. A spectrophotometer is, so we can take our solution, and when we use a spectrophotometer, we put it in what's called a cuvette. A cuvette is kind of like a rectangular prism, um, a rectangular test tube. So then we have our volume of solution in here that has some amount of turbidity. Um, then we place this into a machine. When we place it into the machine, the machine um, has light that's going to go through it, and you can change the wavelength of the light. <clears throat> so you can do, you'll do various readings at different types of wavelengths. So the wavelengths will then go through, and then it'll have a reading on the other side. So it has an indicator over here, and it'll give a reading. And that reading will give you the percent transmittance. So how much light how much light is transmitted through the sample uh, and or it will give you absorbance. So the amount of say amount of light absorbed by the sample. So <clears throat> This again is a oops, spectrophotometer, a spectrophotometer, um, and it's going to be used to measure the percent transmittance or absorbance, or and or absorbance, because you just press a button and it switches to absorbance, press the button again, it switches to percent transmittance. So <clears throat> we can get how much light is going through, how much is absorbed, and we can use those numbers again kind of in a standard format um, to determine how many cells are in there. It's an indirect, again, cell count. So we're not going to have an answer like, you know, 25 or something like that. We're going to have a percentage oftentimes, or we'll just have a general number. So some downfalls of this, or just some parameters for this, is that you have to have enough cells to produce turbidity. <clears throat> So have to have enough cells to produce turbidity. So again, you could have lots and lots of viable cells in there, but if it's not enough to be turbid um, or have some sort of cloudiness, then you're not going to get a number for that. Um, and then it'll correlate with the number of cells by first you make a calibration curve, <clears throat> and then with that plant count, um, then it's going to give you the cell density. So it'll give you the measurements and turbidity, and that gives you the cell density. So it correlates with number of cells by making a what's called a calibration curve. And the calibration curve is basically, I said over here, you can change the wavelength. So what you would do is you would put it through a series of different wavelengths, and then you would calculate, or you would um, take the percent transmittance or absorbance, and then you would put that on a graph. And you could see the percent transmittance or absorbance um, based on the different wavelengths. So that's a calibration curve here. So it correlates with the number of cells by making a calibration curve, and that is with those plate counts. Um, that's the measurement and turbidity. <clears throat> so this will give cell density. All right, so then the next indirect cell count would be dry weight. <clears throat> 
So as its name implies, <clears throat> the cell suspension is going to be filtered. So through another one of those membrane filters that catches the microorganisms because the pore size is so small. Um, so the cell suspension is filtered. That is not is. Is filtered or centrifuged. So again, filtered using a small pore size membrane or centrifuge where it's put in a centrifuge and then spun very, very quickly. So it draws all of those cells down toward the bottom of the test tube, leaving the media on the top. <clears throat> so it's filtered or centrifuged, then it's washed to get any debris out, for example, and then dried. So it'll be slowly dried. <clears throat> And then the drying or the degree of drying is going to be standardized. So it'll be for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature in order to have this standard drying to account for any residual water that could be in there. So um, you don't want to dry it out so much that you start to actually burn the organisms, which then, of course, would start to turn them to ash or something, for example. Um, but you would standardize the drying time. So uh, the degree of drying... must be standardized to account for the residual <clears throat> water content. So we standardize that. And in this case, um, this is a really good one, a really good method for filamentous organisms. So those that have filaments that are um, rather large in size, you know, generally, because we're talking about microorganisms. Um, <clears throat> so this is really helpful for filamentous organisms. Uh, so then some other indirect cell methods that are mentioned <clears throat> is to measure metabolic reactions. Um, so something like ATP formation, and by measuring the metabolic reactions, what we're doing is measuring those products, really. So ATP formation, um, the biosynthesis, biosynthesis of proteins, proteins or nucleic acids, um, the consumption of oxygen, consumption of oxygen, so we can measure the oxygen before, the oxygen after, and other things like that. So um, anything that is going to be some sort of metabolic process can be measured. There can be indicators. It can be a change in color. It can be a change in weight. It can be, um, for this example, a change in oxygen. And that can be measured, and then we can kind of backwards math or use some sort of standard or chart or table to then tell us about how many organisms or CFUs, depending on the case, um, are in that sample. All right, so that wraps up uh, this portion of 9.1, and we will have the second portion of 9.1 in the next video.